Lock Talk Radio. <laughs> He took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America. By some, he's been called controversial. I'll keep my freedom. I'll keep my guns. Try to keep my money and my religion too. Now, now, keep in mind that some of my guests have been approached by oh, Homeland Security or FBI saying, Oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Douglas show? My message to those guys, if they're listening this morning, is go get a cup of coffee. Maybe you'll learn something. We both took the same oath, you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. I'm going to keep my FBA, keep my friends the same. Keep the government out of my business and y'all can keep the change. He is the free American, Clay Douglas. It's the Free American Hour, weekdays at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. I'll keep the UFA and y'all can keep the chain. For the podcast and more details, visit www.freeamerican.com or catch the podcast by phone by calling 832-999-8621. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Free American Hour. I'm your host, Clay Douglas. My guest today is Debbie Lewis, and we're going to be talking about her and her husband's new film, Ron Paul Rising, and you can uh, get more information on that at uh, ronpaulrising.com. Hello, Debbie. How are you? Hi, and it's the the ronpauluprising.com. The, the name Ron of the film is... The Ron Paul Uprising, yeah. The Ron Paul. All right, I'll make a uh, I'll, I'll make a uh, continuation of that. All right, it's, and it's, it's working. Uprising, here. not rising, of course. Uprising, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, we got that, and um, all right. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I do want to um, say something about what's going on. You know, the media has said over and over that he is no longer running and of course that's not true he's using his funds in the best way he can to save his money but because he has very little money but he is you know his supporters are working through the delegate process which is the constitutional way to be elected so i'd like to throw that out there to listeners who don't understand that your listeners probably do however but and a lot of people ask me, and I just say, you know, he, he hasn't uh, suspended his campaign. He suspended his spending where he doesn't feel like it's going to do him any good. And he really has, I mean, the information that I'm getting in from these, uh, from different sources, is that uh, the Ron Paul supporters basically outnumber everyone else in the Republican Party, and they've just decided that uh, uh, the delegates aren't locked in to vote for any particular uh, nominee. Right. The delegates, it, it depends on each state conference really and truly how they do that, but most of them are not locked in. They'll try to tell you they are because of the quote-unquote state primary and the state primary says that, the, you know, for instance, let me just give you an example in the state of Missouri. state of Missouri, the primary was a waste of $7 million of taxpayer funds, okay? $7 million of taxpayer funds was wasted on a primary which does zero good in the state of Missouri because we are a caucus state. So there was no reason for them to have that primary, but in the primary, I think 40% of the people turned out for that, and Rick Santorum won. Uh, at the delegate level, however, our state convention just concluded this past weekend, and um, we have a three-part delegate uh, process, so to speak. So on the district level, 
some of the districts, St. Charles Parish, the district that I am in, District 4, we actually had a majority of Ron Paul delegates. Well, the state tried to tell us that you couldn't vote for Ron Paul because Santorum won the state. You had to vote for Santorum. Well, that's not true. So then you get to the state convention level, and they're trying to tell you, you know, the districts are trying to tell you you're locked in for whoever you were elected for at the district level now. And that's not true either. So when you get to Tampa, I'm not sure how those rules will play out. But if no one has a clear majority, which is 50% plus one, if no one has a clear majority by the time they get to Tampa, then all the delegates are released after the first vote. And I think it's after the first vote. It might be after the second or third. But after the first vote, it's somewhere along that line. And then they can vote for whoever they want to. So that's why it is important to continue to educate people about Ron Paul, because if you're a Ron Paul supporter, he can still win. This is not a lock. And the Republican Party, you can you can tell that Romney is not locked in because if he was, the Republican Party wouldn't be pulling the crap they're pulling at the state conventions. So, you know, this is what this is what has to. I mean, this is what people have to understand. You need to know that there's still there's still a chance that he can win because Romney does not have. Regardless of what the media says, Romney does not have that 1,144 delegates, and, and that's what he has to have to win. He does not have it. And uh, the last, the the last actual count that I saw, uh, Romney had under 700. So, and, and you know, of course, Santorum supporters, even though he's quote unquote suspended his campaign, which is not ended it, he suspended it. He's still getting delegates. Newt Gingrich is still getting delegates, and so is Ron Paul. So those delegate counts are still going up, and depending on how, you know, we can educate the people as to Ron Paul's message, he's got a lot of supporters, but you have to be able to educate the people around to get them to switch their vote when the, after the first after the first round of delegate voting is given so that all those can be now unlocked or what, what do they call it? Um, oh, I'm just, the, the word just left my mind, but then they can vote for whoever they want to vote for. Well, let's talk about the uh, media and Ron Paul's coverage. I, up on my website, I took issue with a Tea Party site, Tea Party Nation. <laughs> And they came out with it, trying to trash Ron Paul, trying to trash all of his followers. And this was uh, maybe a month or two after uh, the NAACP had tried to uh, alienate me from the uh, any participation in the tea parties. And and I responded to it. You know, I was called a Paul Tard and. Uh, and they went on. Now, you know, I, I had some hope from the whole in the Fed movement and the Tea Party movement and maybe even the Occupy. What right. The, and, and then suddenly they're attacking the one man that's trying to stand up for him. You know, and, and Ron Paul ought to be getting both the liberal and, and the conservative. I mean, on the liberal side, he wants to legalize hemp here again in this country, legalized right. uh, uh, marijuana here. He says the drug war is a failure. So, you know, any liberal out there that cares or any of the 50 million people that have been busted for pot over the right. last 50 years ought to be standing up for Ron Paul and voting for Ron Paul. And oh, the sure. conservatives, my God, he wants to audit the Fed. He wants to stop the Fed. He wants to return us to a constitutional basis. Anybody that is not supporting Ron Paul has to be working for the Communist Party or, you know, uh, is that the Democrats? Or, or I, I said, you know, I used to be fairly comfortable being called a right-wing extremist when Clinton was in office, but when Bush got in office, I, I felt more liberal. What? what yeah. Two wings of the same bird, isn't it? 
It is. It, it absolutely is. But here's something else. You know, when, when Bush was in office, the uh, liberals just whined and whined and whined about his warmongering ways. Just whine, whine, whine. He's a warmonger, which he is. I'm not trying to say he's not. But, you know, whine, whine, whine. We're in these illegal wars. Whine, whine, whine. Get us out. Bring our troops home. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, we have three years of spending records with Obama in office now, okay? And Obama, if you remember, ran on a ticket of hope and change. He's going to change things. He's going to bring our troops home within 16 months. That's the quote. 16 months. His first task was going to be to get our troops home. Well, his first task in office was a drone attack against Pakistan. That was his first action in office. But besides for that, if you go over the last three years, and Wired did an exceptional article called The Dead, The Dr Dollars, The Drones, 9-11 Era by the Numbers, and I have that posted on my website on the main page on securingliberty.com. You can go down past the news because I post relevant news. I don't just post everything that the news posts, but I post what people need to look at or what I feel like people need to look at anyway. If you go down there and you look at it and you do the math yourself, because I did the math myself, you find out that on average per year Bush was in office, he spent around $481 billion in military spending. Obama, the peace president, you know, he won a peace prize. He ran on a platform of peace. He's going to bring our troops home, right? His average per year spending in military is over $688 billion. That's a lot of money for a man who says he's for peace. The troop average is, his troop average per year is more, sending overseas, unbelievably, about 30,000 troops more per year than Bush's average per year to send overseas. Special forces, he sent about 10,000 more special forces overseas per year he's been in office. His drone flight hours <laughs> are astounding. He uh, Bush's drone flight hours are like 144,000 plus. Obama's drone flight hours are, are over 500,000. Well, let me stop you right there and ask you. I mean, I've, I've just put up something by Brother Nathaniel on my site talking about who's controlling these drones that and 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 they basically they're selling them to police departments and they're they're they're, yeah. they're spreading them all around right and of course now you know you've heard the news they're they're going to use the drones in the united states and well you know too bad about your right to privacy it doesn't matter anymore you know you don't have a right to privacy because they're going to take it over but my point is, too, oh, and the wiretap, let me tell you about that. Per year, Bush ordered 1,714 wiretaps. Per year he's been in office, Obama has ordered 2,785 wiretaps. So, Democrats, repeat, repeat that for me. Repeat those statistics. What? Did, how many wiretaps could I got? Uh, my I got wiretapped under Bush in an accident arranged. Mm -hmm. But uh, how many Bush? wiretaps for Bush yep. and how many for Obama? And this is averaged out over the years he was in office. Remember, so if you average it out per year he was in office, Bush ordered seventeen hundred fourteen wiretaps. One seven one four. And Obama, since he's been in office, and this is actually just two years. They they didn't have figures for 2011 when they did this. Obama had ordered 2,785 wiretaps. He had 5,570 wiretaps in two years. Two years. So if that doesn't tell you what you need to know about Obama... And, and the Obama supporters about his military activity, his military spending, all of that, you know, somebody needs to consider, <laughs> you know, Democrats who claim that they are constitutional need to look at that because 
He's not being constitutional. He, you know, he's a constitutional expert. And everybody wants to say that. Oh, Obama's a constitutional expert. Well, he is a constitutional expert. He knows exactly what he needs to do, just like everybody else, to subvert the Constitution, go around it, and do what he wants to do anyway. And Bush was a master of that, you know, in those executive orders that he signed, yeah, or the. It'd be so much easier. Paper. It'd be so much easier if it was uh, if I if uh, if this was a dictatorship and I was the dictator. Yeah, exactly. And we've got that. We've got that now. We what with the oh, NDAA, yeah. you know, I've I've said uh, many times that the uh, Iraq War it was like a training ground for our troops to come back to this country. I mean, I filmed the first Homeland Security meeting. You know, case right. of a single outbreak of smallpox in a major metropolitan area, we'll need 400,000 well-armed, well-trained, organized, disciplined troops to control the American people because some of them just won't follow orders. Yeah. Well, then I, you know, think about it. And, and this is where, you know, you mentioned the Tea Party before and being against Ron Paul. It's kind of funny to me because... It was Ron Paul who brought so much notoriety to the Tea Party, you know, and then you talk about losing your freedoms, and the Tea Party is just, it's been taken over, I think, by the Republican Party for sure, but it's just like, what is it about your freedom that you don't understand? Why are you so willing to give up your, your freedom? Why are you so willing to bow down to a government who has lost its mind, in my opinion. I mean, that that's yeah. just it, it, totally it, my opinion. You know, James Forrestal, in a conversation with uh, Joe McCarthy, you know, McCarthy made a comment about them being stupid, and uh, Forrestal said, no, consistency is not the mark of stupidity. If they were just stupid, occasionally they'd make a mistake in our favor. Right. That's a good point. And, and the uh, Obama is, if you really think about it now, depending from the viewpoint that you think about it, Obama is the perfect. He's absolutely perfect for the role that he was assigned, and he told you what he was right from the beginning. I'm a change agent. I'm a yeah. Soviet change agent. And he is the perfect New World Order leader. This may be why he was uh, the first non-Russian appointed to uh, head up the Security Council. Mm -hmm. and, and he's black. He's white. He's Muslim. He's Christian. He's he's Jewish. He is everything. He's and every he's every person. <laughs> you know that song "I'm Every Woman." Well, he's every person. There you go. And, you know, look at it this way. He's articulate, so he appeals to people who feel like they're intelligent. You know what I mean? He's nice looking. He's young. He's So he appeals to the younger crowd, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's like, you know, he's like, well, he's like a god to oh, some of these and, people. And, 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 I mean, literally. And he's gay, too? I mean, he swings both ways? <laughs> yeah. My God, is that perfect or what? What a perfect New World Order leader. Now, now, what's he got in mind for us? What uh, have you, 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 your films, you, you know, Washington, you're fired, and, uh, you know, quite a few others up on 9-11. So, so, uh, what do you see happening now? I mean, everything, everything I've talked about and predicted uh, about what FEMA was going to become is happening now. And uh, William's done the same thing. We told, you told the truth about 9-11. I mean, come on, you know. And, uh, <laughs> you want to call me a conspiracy theorist? You know, George Bush made me look sick. He, he wanted you to believe a bunch of Arabs in a cave in Afghanistan made the U.S. Air Force stand down. <laughs> well, you know, that if, you, if you're looking at 9-11, there's a lot of evidence that people don't tend to, either they, they haven't seen it because they just want to believe the official story, right? Or they ha haven't heard of it, period. But, you know, most of us know that there was a military exercise going on that very day, that exact same scenario. Right? Right. Okay. FEMA was already in New York the day before. Right. Right. Some people don't know that, but that's the truth. 
and the military was given a stand down order possibly because of the exercise and they thought you know somebody has thrown out there that maybe that exercise went live you know and by accident or whatever but they're not admitting whatever it is they're not admitting and we know that there are people that know what's going on because in I want to say 2006 2007 somewhere around in there the BBC did a special called 9-11 conspiracy file I believe that's the name of it in which they interviewed uh, several people and one of the people they interviewed other than um, uh, Davin Coburn, which is the quote-unquote expert on demolitions, <laughs> whatever, um, was Florida Senator Bob Graham. Florida Senator Bob Graham told the told the people that you know there is an explanation for which the the government will not put it forward. So he knows something. They. The, the American people have lost trust in their government because the government won't explain what happened. Again, he knows something he's not saying, or he knows that there's something that could be told. You know what I mean? And he went on to say that the, the people have totally lost trust in their government because of that. Well, duh, you know. We, we all know so it, You can look... If you totally look objectively, and you don't have to buy into any one story, because when we when we put out 9-11 in plain sight, the first movie that William did, the first film that he did, when they put that out, they weren't making any conclusions. They weren't saying, well, it was an inside job, and we know who did it, and it's the government, and Bush was involved, and blah, 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 right down the list. They didn't do that. What they did was they just looked at the photographs and the video and they said you know the White House says this is what happened but this isn't what this film shows you know that's not it you know the White House says that happened but that's not what this shows and they went right down that line you know showing that the film it, it doesn't line up and that's what people need to look at you know you need to look at it objectively something's not right let me, let, me, let, right. me, let, me, let me ask you. Now, this is something that this is basically a viewpoint that a lot of people have avoided, and I try to deal with it directly. You know, I, I understand how propaganda works because I went through it. You know, I started the militias after Waco because I was pretty upset, and I started the Free American Magazine because I was pretty upset watching 17 little children being murdered. By no, no, government, kidding. and uh, and the press didn't cover this. They didn't cover it. Now the press is not covering Ron Paul now. Right. And the press started attacking me, and the press was fed by the ADL and Southern Poverty Law. They listed me as <laughs> armed and dangerous. Now, you know, I don't care what religion you are. The Constitution covers that. Correct. If you want to bang your head against that Wayland wall over there, knock yourself out. I'll watch. I'll watch. <laughs> if you want to stick your nose in the dirt and your ass up in the air, I'll even try to keep St. Bernard off of you. <laughs> Why do you pray to Mecca? And if you want to get down on your knees and pray to God for a Cadillac, hey, I just hope he don't drop it on you. But don't expect me to get down on my knees with you. I won't do that. Uh -huh. And to me, that's what America is about. But the people that have attacked me and the media and the people that attacked Ron Paul on the Tea Party and in the Republican Party and in, of course, the Democratic Party, uh, too, you know, there's, uh, there is a certain Jewish influence Mm -hmm. And but Clay, you could do so much better if you just would be like Alex Jones and not talk about the Jews and and and, and stop talking about marijuana. You know, being the number one cash crop of America. Well, yeah. let me let me give you a little clue about some of that. Okay. First of all, 
I'll just start with marijuana, and then I'll go to the other one because uh, I've just recently gotten some information. But right. marijuana, number one, is a victim of crime. Number two, our forefathers grew hemp. <laughs> that was their crop. So you're going to tell me that the men that founded this country wrote our documents are were doing something illegal? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. When, they, when they, they were they, searching they, for their freedom? They wrote those documents, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. They wrote it on hemp paper. The Encyclopedia Britannica was printed for 100 years on hemp paper. Yeah. So I don't think they did anything wrong. Now, right. what about the Jewish influence? Now, you know, I've got quotes up on my site from rabbis that said, uh, you know, they had sacrificed uh, 100 million people by, and that was back in 1849, uh, by getting us Christians, us white people, to to slaughter each other like we did in Russia and Germany and uh, France mm -hmm. and England and everywhere else. And uh, the rabbi says uh, they do that to make more room for the Jews. What about the, and, and let's talk about the ADL, because this uh, these people were, uh, uh, have been on the attack. They are the hate group, not the militia, not the Tea Parties, not the Christian identity, not the militias. We're not. We're not the enemies. We are foreign people, and if it's good for us and our families, then it's going to be good for you and your family, whatever religion you are, whatever color you are. Mm -hmm. Divide and conquer is what they try to do to us. They try to separate from us, and a lot of that is the media. The media is somehow guilty here of trying to suppress Ron Paul, suppress really answers, because, in my opinion, the media and the government and the FBI work for the banks, who controls the banks? Rothschilds? Rockefellers? Yep. You know, those are the yep. bad guys. Right, right, right. And, and and when you're talking about the ADL, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. When you're talking about the ADL and you're talking about the Southern Poverty Law Center and you're talking about the, you know, the Jewish influence on our society, I, I, I I tend to refer to that as the Zionist influence on our society. Yes, ma'am. Because there are Jews that are absolutely against the Zionists. Yes, ma'am. But, but I ran across something of interest, and I've got the book. I have not read it yet, but it's called The Transfer Agreement. Have you heard about that? I have not. Okay, this fellow, his name is Edwin Black. He is a Jew. He found an agreement, um, let's see, August 17, 1933, the leaders of the Zionist movement concluded a secret, controversial pact with the Third Reich, which formed a transferred some of the 60,000 Jews and $100 million to Jewish Palestine to save them from whatever was about to go on. So... You know, this this is a part of history that I do not know enough about to talk about, but it looks to me like the Zionists, the Zionists now, were working with Hitler to save themselves and put the more innocent people under the bus. That wouldn't be the first time that's ever happened, you know. No, they hide these elitists, these Zionists, these right. international banksters that Henry Ford tried to tell you about and said if you ever knew what was going on with your banks, there'd be a revolution overnight. Yeah, exactly. They've been trying to tell us this for, for years. I've got a film up, so they tried to tell you right now on my website. But uh, they, they hide they hide behind the Jewish people, and they'll sacrifice the Jewish people. They'll load them on the trains and put them in work camps. Right. And, you know, the information well, they're the that slaves I got... for the for the Zionists. Yes, yes. So, and this is what people need to understand. This, this is bigger than, you know, it, it, it's not Jews per se, although they claim to be Jews. It's not Jews per se, they're Zionists. And this is what people need to understand, too. And I've got a really good book that I'm reading, a really interesting book, not good. It's just interesting because of the facts that are in it. And it's called Pawns in the Game by William Guy Carr. Have you heard of that book? I've heard of the book, yes. Yeah, the book is really interesting. And in the 
in the introduction it talks about how the Zionist, political Zionism, is part of the plan to take over the world, you know? Now, so let me let me stop you right there because this may be pre-Zionist. This may have come.